You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. Hello and welcome to another hopefully fun holiday episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm your host, Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And we're really excited about this show. We're deviating from our little normal structure of white wines and red wines, and we're delving into these sparkling champagnes, which is so prevalent and fun for the holidays. And as our friends and the ladies like to say, where there's bubbles, there's troubles. <laughs> so we're going to be having some fun talking about these particular three sparkling wines. And we do have to call them sparkling because of certain areas we'll get into later. And we're going to talk a little bit about the history about champagne and sparkling. And then we're going to have some fun drinking the My sparkling. My favorite part of the show. The favorite part of the show. At the end of the show, I'm going to show you some great uh, gift ideas for people who like wine and sort of uh, obscure type gifts when it comes to wine. And I think what's interesting about champagne sparkling wine is some of the history and how it supposedly all started. And I think what's interesting about that is there are some contradictions. Some people think it's actually older than what it is. Some people say the actual idea of sparkling wine started in, I think, around 1600, I believe. 1521. 1521. Go back far enough, uh, there's some Benedictine monks who uh, by accident, produced a, a bottle that uh, fermented twice and ended up having some bubbly uh, effect to it. So that was uh, what started this whole trend. And there have been a lot of claims since then that it was uh, Dom Perignon who started this, and that was the 1600s. Uh, That's date right. That and you're uh, with. I think to have some national conflict, some people think that the British actually invented champagne. I think uh, around the time of the early 1600s, French hadn't perfected a strong enough glass to actually hold right. the pressure in of the bottles because they kept blowing up. It was a very dangerous job uh, before this method got perfected to, to go in and turn the bottles because there was a lot of explosions. And of course, that would set off a chain reaction. So one bottle would blow up and then the one next to it would blow up and pretty soon your yeah, that's entire vintage was wiped out. Yes, the whole village wiped out, covered in champagne. <laughs> um, one of the things the English had perfected, of course, was uh, the ability to make a stronger glass. Yeah and to keep the pressure inside. And if memory serves me, I think they also had a tendency, uh, I think when wine was coming from the Champagne region of France around that time, it was generally flat. And the English had a tendency to, as they imported it, to put sugar in it, which would yep. give it a sparkle crystallization. Yep. But at the same time, some people think because of the sugar that was in it and forming the bubbles that the British should get a little bit of a plug for the creation. French of aren't going to give up any and of their. <laughs> that's always a great argument to have when you're having friends over, yeah, especially if you have some French people over, because they will, of course, completely disagree with that whole theory. And Another invention that came from that era, Bob, was, was the wire cage on the top of the bottle. Uh, this was actually developed to heap, help, help keep the cork in place. Uh, a lot of these exploding bo bottles were caused by the pressure just forcing the cork out. Uh, and this was actually something Dom Perignon did invent. He, he put a wire cage on top of the bottle kept the whole thing secured throughout the fermentation process. Uh, so, and when was that roughly, uh, Don? Uh, that's in the 1600s. That was in the yeah. 1600s, yeah. And one of the things that I enjoy about sparkling is I personally like my sparkling on the colder side, and so generally I like keeping it chilled as best as possible. Now, obviously we have our three bottles displayed not being chilled. Please don't serve it that way. 
generally, I think it's better to keep them in some type of ice bucket. Well, yeah, in all fairness, these did just come out of the refrigerator. They so. did just come out of the refrigerator, <laughs> but in general, when you are having them at your home or you bring them to a friend's house, try to keep them chilled for as long as possible until you're actually ready to consume them. Yes. And also, we're going to be talking about the stemware for sparkling champagne. I find that the higher the stemware, the more concentration of bubbles, which I enjoy. I like a real fizzy champagne when I drink it or sparkling. I do too. And uh, during the Victorian era, it was actually popular to serve in a glass that had a, a much wider mouth. Um, but that over-oxygenates the champagne and the bubbles disappear much too rapidly. Uh, but that was popularized by Marie Antoinette. That's correct with the sort of the wider. The, yes, the big wide goblet shape. Uh, it looks almost like a margarita glass. That actually sort of carried into uh, this, er, this century, didn't it? The 21st you century? You still see that century? today. Uh, people are trying to look sophisticated. They'll, they'll use a wide champagne glass instead of a flute like this. Um, and if you're going to drink the champagne very quickly, it's, go ahead to, it's okay to go ahead and use that kind of glass. Uh, but if you're going to let the champagne linger, you want to use uh, something with a longer stem. And generally, us and our friends, we don't usually let champagne linger too long. <laughs> so that's not usually an issue. But I also like pouring half pours of champagne or sparkling. I know some people tend to like filling the glass all the way to the top. I think if you keep a half pour, it stays cooler. And I prefer just having one or two steps and then refilling it so I can get the coolness on my palate. Yeah. But it's a preference, but um, I don't know if you have a preference yourself. Uh, if you're going to be sampling a lot of different champagnes like we are tonight, uh, it's best to have a half pour also. That yeah. way you don't have too much of one type. Uh, you keep the palate fresh for the next champagne. What's also interesting, and I'm sure some of you probably already know this, is when you call something a champagne, in theory and legally, it has to come from the Champagne region yes. of France. Mm -hmm. Now, I myself have a tendency to call pretty much any type of French sparkling champagne. I know that's a faux pas, but that's too bad. That's just what I do. And, but there are some fantastic sparklings that come from France, which, in my opinion, are just as good as an authentic champagne. And we're going to try one tonight, as a matter of fact. We are going to try one tonight. And I think, uh, just for some of our uh, watchers tonight, the Champagne region of France, is that is that in the northern area of France generally? or? Yeah, it's a northern area of France. Um, uh, not as far north as Alsace and Lorraine, but uh, you're getting up in the northern part of the country. And also the pressure inside a Champagne bottle or a sparkling bottle can, I think, be up to 90 pounds per square inch. I believe. I, and I didn't know that until you did a little research I did a little tonight, research but. on that because, believe me, I've had some experiences mm. opening uh, champagne or sparkling, <laughs> especially in some of our nice BYOB restaurants here in the area. And I think one of my quirks is still stuck in Pazzo's <laughs> roof uh, back when they were BYOB. Uh, we're going to demonstrate the proper way to open a bottle tonight. Yeah, and there uh, are different so there ways, are... but uh, I think uh, some of Napoleon's um, generals used to like using the saber yes. to open the bottle. Yes, that gets a little dangerous, but... Let me advise against that. <laughs> Don't try that at home. <laughs> now, also, I want to also emphasize that a well-made sparkling is certainly equal to a poorly made champagne. And there are some champagnes that I think are justifiably expensive, but also are justifiably not expensive, but you're paying just for the fact that they're champagne. Just like any other wine varietal, uh, you're going to find great wines at a lot of different price, price points. Uh, so you're going to find some great wines in the $10 to $15 range, and you know, maybe not, a not so good wine at the $30, $40 range. Uh, Excellent point. And I want to emphasize again, because you know what the show is about. If you watched our first episode, we are going to be tasting some really good stuff, hopefully. I think there's some things here tonight that Jim has not experienced, nope. and uh, it's always good when we have a little banter back and forth whether he likes something or I don't. But what we are tasting tonight, well, I'll just say it. It's under around the $20 price point or lower, So, and it's stuff that you can serve to anybody that'll taste just as good as a more expensive sparkling champagne or sparkling wine or champagne. And I think we're going to also, before we even open these two, which is the uh, Luis Pedre and the Gerard Bertrand, we're going to talk a little bit about Prosecco, which is the Italian version of a sparkling. And I also have a preference to that sometimes, too. I Generally, uh, as far as taste goes, I prefer a Prosecco. Um, it's, got a, it's made a little bit differently than a Champagne. Uh, champagne undergoes a second fermentation inside the bottle. Uh, with the Italian version of, of making sparkling wine, they actually do the second uh, fermentation in a vat, and then they bottle it. Uh, and this gives you 
um, a bubble that's a little bit smaller, uh, a little more lingering, and uh, the flavor of the wine's a little bit different. You get a lot more fruit, uh, some usually apricot, pear, apple taste. Um, but it's also uh, because of, of the second fermentation taking place in a, a large vat instead of inside each individual bottle, it makes it cheaper to manufacture, so you get uh, more bang for your buck with the Prosecco. And also, um, Prosecco, which is interesting, is up until about the early mid-60s, Prosecco tends to be on the sweet side. Yes. And I actually prefer most of my whites dry and for champagne or sparkling brute. And we are basically tasting brute tonight, except for the rosé, which is going to be very interesting for both of us, because yeah. um, there are some really good rosés out there in a sparkling or champagne form. Gerard Bertrand also makes an absolutely fantastic rosé um, that is to die for. And all this stuff that you see here tonight is available easily in the area. Wine Cellars in Farmington, Steve Leon has a great sampling, and so do other places in the area. But um, that's where these are from tonight. And I think I will open up this bottle all right. right now. We will start will on this the Villa Jolanda Prosecco. Now, when you're opening this, you want to point it away from people. Don't do what I did at a restaurant. <laughs> Actually, what I generally like to do is I, if I'm at a restaurant or at home, I have a little towel that I'll keep on top. So in case the cork does fly out, it's at least in the towel and not going straight up in the air. That's an excellent tip. And when I remove the towel, I have my thumbs on the top. Most of the time, these do pull out easily. There are some that are a little difficult. There are also some people, when they're at home or even at a restaurant, like to hear the pop. I actually like to take it out slowly so you don't hear the pop. And that's how, that's not a bad pop, but some people pull it right out and it and, overflows. Yeah. And, and you also see, uh, uh, especially people after winning a sports event, shake the bottle and spray it all over the place, which is a huge waste of champagne in my opinion, but that's part of the celebratory nature of this excellent, excellent beverage. So for the uh, Prosecco, I think I will use a tall glass because I want to emphasize the bubble situation because there are fine bubbles, there are not so fine bubbles, and we're going to see the difference hopefully on camera as to what those differences are. Jim, I will pour you some of this. Excellent. Now you notice Bob is pouring at a 45 degree angle. Uh, you're getting a lot of head on the, the champagne initially. That will dissipate almost immediately though. Uh, some people like to pour uh, straight in, which gives you uh, even more head on top of the champagne. And this is almost uh, like the, the beer wars. You know, Absolutely. Some people want a lot of foam on the top, and some people don't want any foam. Uh, but as you can see, the foam is gone now, and we're just down to the champagne. Yep. I think we should actually pour the rosé to compare, uh, maybe do a little comparison right. in regards to the bubbles. Now, I think you could already see a difference a little bit in the, uh, the head on this. There's actually not as many bubbles in this one. I could always already sense the bouquet. And when it comes to a rosé sparkling, I think... Well, yeah, so you can see that the Prosecco has absolutely. a lot more bubbles, and uh, they are smaller. They are smaller, absolutely. So let's give this one a shot, and let's see what our palate says about this one. All right. Fizzy on the tongue, which I like. Lots of fruit. Lots of fruit. And a nice sort of little bit of a lingering aftertaste. I love the finish on this. Uh, it, yeah, it, it's not harsh. It's uh, still kind of wet on the back of the tongue. And, and it, as you said, it, it lingers. And there is a bouquet in champagne. Most people think, or I keep saying champagne, but just refer to that as both sparkling and or <clears throat> champagne. There is a bouquet, and uh, there should be. You should be able to smell something for sparkling. I get some floral notes with this. Yep. Absolutely. And I think most Prosecco, I think, has to come from the uh, Veneto region of Italy. I think just like Champagne, to call something a Prosecco, there's a certain area of Italy where it has to come from. Yes. And I do believe it's, it's the Veneto area, per se, and I do think that's licensed. So yeah, Italy has uh, laws governing all this, uh, just like France. So they're trying to protect uh, the name that grows the grapes as well as protect the brand name of the beverage that they're marketing. All right, let's try the rosé here. All right. Uh, 
That's interesting. <clears throat> I think I like the rosé a little bit better than the Prosecco, at least for this example, because it's a little bit flatter and doesn't sort of overwhelm my, my tongue or my palate. Right I now. found it to taste the same. It's a softer taste, um, uh, but there's less jumping out of this wine. So, you know, where I got so much fruit from the Prosecco, uh, I get almost nothing here. And, and in part, that's due to the fact that my palate has been overwhelmed by the Prosecco. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're going to drink something on its own, drink the Prosecco, enjoy the fruit. Uh, if you're pairing, you know, cheese, crackers, uh, some kind of hors d'oeuvre, uh, or a dessert even, uh, and you don't want to overwhelm that with the wine, uh, you can go ahead and serve this rosé. It would be an excellent pairing. I completely agree. And uh, just a little history <clears throat> on the Luis here. Um, it's made, not obviously in the Champagne region, though it is a sparkling, but it's made in the very similar fashion as all the most expensive champagnes are. And I think, if memory also serves me, the f is it the primary, they're aged in oak vats, I believe? And then they move to bottles. Then they move to bottles. Yeah. And some of the ones like a Prosecco, I think, are used, or they use steel. Right. Which is why it tends to be a little bit more or less expensive. But in no way should that differentiate the flavor sometimes. But in this case, I think the, the Luis, and once again, I'm partial to French myself, I do think oak bats. Do well, when you, when you see uh, Method Champenoise, that's the, the French method for making champagne, uh, what that means is that they've, they've put the wine in the bottle and turned the bottle upside down. And then they pay someone to every day go in and twist the bottle just a little bit and give it a little tap in the case. So That's it, a nice job. It, it's it's uh, tough work. It but is But you're tough doing work. it thousands and thousands of bottles all day long every day. Yeah, that is true. Um, so there's there's a lot of labor that's built into the cost of making a champagne. Um, and, and with a Prosecco, you don't have that cost because all the fermentation takes place in the vat and then they bottle it immediately. And I think a rosé, at least this particular one, is a blend of a Pinot Noir and a Syrah. I'm not sure that's the case for this, all rosés, but this particular this one, I particular think, This particular one was a, yeah, it was a Syrah Yeah, And I think this, especially for the holidays, mm. turkey, ham, both these would pair very well. Oh, absolutely. And you really can't absolutely. go wrong with either one of them, at least so far. I'm going to take another sip of this one. And the great thing is, uh, you know, anytime you break out the bubbly, you know it's a festive occasion. Uh, I, you don't even have to serve food. That's actually true, and a lot of times we actually don't serve food. We, uh, <laughs> when we are with our, uh, our ladies or friends, that um, sometimes it's really just the sparkling that gets served, <laughs> which, once again, that's why bubbles usually lead to troubles. And You want to move on to the Gerard Bertrand? Yeah, I'm going to move on to the Gerard Bertrand. I think uh, we'll get back to these. I tend not to like sh let champagne sit too long or sparkling sit too long in a glass. Um, it's not like red wine <clears throat> or white wine, but... I think if it sits too long without being drank, it sort of you lose a lot of the flavor. That's my personal opinion. I don't know if you. No, agree. That, you're you're correct, and you bring up uh, another good point here. Um, with when you're drinking proseccos, you want to drink those almost immediately. Uh, a lot of times, people like to buy wine and, and store it for a while, and that's that's excellent if you're drinking uh, red wines, uh, big bold Cabernet Sauvignons. Uh, but with proseccos, uh, those are meant to be consumed almost immediately. Um, you can store them for up to three years. Some of the really good brands you can store for up to seven years, um, but with, with the, the one we're going to drink tonight, you know, you buy it this year, you can drink it this year, you don't have to store it, uh, it's, it's ready to be consumed. So is there, an, in your opinion, from what you've experienced, how long could you store, in general, a sparkling or champagne, if they're stored properly? I, uh, I wouldn't store one more than seven years. Okay. Um, they don't usually last that long for us. No. no uh, <laughs> just, that's not usually a problem. All right. Now, Gerard Bertrand is a very interesting guy. He uh, was an ex-rugby player. He um, has a vast vineyard, I think over 250 acres in <laughs> France. And he's a very traditional winemaker. And he's just up and coming here in this, this country. You cannot find this everywhere. Um, but if you can, like I said, it's locally available at wine cellars in Farmington. But it's a phenomenal value. Now, I want to point out on the label, uh, this is a, a Cremant, uh, which means this is not from the Champagne region of France. Uh, this comes from uh, the Alsace region. So legally, they cannot call this champagne. They have to call it uh, Cremant or sparkling wine. An interesting side note, uh, there was a company in California that shipped 3,000 bottles of uh, sparkling wine over to Belgium, but they made the mistake of putting champagne on the label. As Soon as that arrived in Belgium, the Belgium authorities seized it and broke all 3,000 bottles. Terrible waste. That is a very terrible waste. All I mean, over a labeling issue. 
I'm crying a little on the inside <laughs> after that story. Now I'm going to be very curious to see if we notice a bubble difference on this one. And I could already see a difference. That is a much thicker head, I think, than the ones we just had before. Hmm. Now, actually, now see, that's, I'm glad we brought different types of glasses because yep. using this thinner stemware, the bubbles are more concentrated. And if you can yes. see gems, they're less concentrated. Stemware makes a difference. It does make a difference. And this goes back to preference. I like a more concentrated hit on my palate when I drink a champagne or sparkling. And I think I'm about to have one. So let me try this and I'll let you know. Now that's more earthy. I get a, a creamier sensation from this. Definitely more earthy. I'm still tasting a little bit. I get some fruit at the end now, which was not apparent uh, on the initial tasting, but it's, as, it, as it lingers, as it fades away, a little bit of fruit. Actually, we could also compare the colors. For these two, they're about <clears> the same, the Prosecco and the Brut uh, Gerard Bertrand. I guess you would say it's like a pale straw color. Yes. And that's somewhat common, I think, for most sparklings. That's typical for sparkling wines. And for a rosé, the colors may or may not vary a little bit depending on what type of rosé you're drinking. Yeah, and again, this, is, this comes down to the winemaker's preference, uh, how much color they're, they're trying to achieve in the final product. Uh, and, and it's also a result of uh, the blending process. Um, you know, if they're blending certain types of grapes, right. um, they're going to get a darker color or a lighter color. Now, for when you're having your Thanksgiving turkey or Christmas ham or whatever it is that you sort of imbibe with, what do you think pairs better with either a turkey or a ham? This goes back to my, my first rule of thumb from last, uh, last episode we did, drink what you like. Um, you know, if you like a lot of fruit, um, I'd, I'd go with the Prosecco that we had tonight. Uh, if you want something that's going to kind of stay behind the scenes and just complement the food. Um, uh, you could serve the Gerard Bertrand or the rosé. I agree. And uh, for me, I particularly like the rosé tonight. And um, I think I might serve this for you've, Thanksgiving. You found your holiday wine. I do. I do. Let right. me take another sip of this one just to make sure that I'm not misleading you. I think that would pair great with a turkey. Now, some people might not agree with me, but that's okay. That's what this whole show is about. Tasting different things and coming to your own conclusions. Now, speaking of holiday wines uh, and gifts, I, I think you've brought a couple other items with you tonight. I have, and uh, I'm very excited about it, actually. Um, for those of you with discriminating friends out there who want something different in the wine gift area, we have something very unique for both our hawk and dove friends. <laughs> we all have some of both. This right here is an ammo box, but is considered a box wine holder. So on this side, you have a general ammo box, but on this side, we have make wine, not war. And how this works is... Now you, you have to order wine... You do. ...through the mail. You do have to order it through the mail, and the wine comes in a somewhat of a package and this is available at um, the20wines.com. Now this is similar to the boxed wines you see in the store. Correct. Uh, it's, it's just a plastic bladder just with a, a bladder. nozzle on the end. And it goes right into the box. It makes a great gift. There's all types of wine available, available and I would highly recommend giving it a shot. And what's, what I think is so unique about it is I love causing controversy. So <laughs> nothing causes controversy more than an ammo box but when the conversation gets a little too political, you just turn around and say, we're making wine, not war. And I think that's a great gift idea. Excellent gift. And they're also available in a more neutral, just a wooden box, which looks nice, but you're not going to get into those political arguments, which I sometimes enjoy doing. And it looks like that hold a bigger bag. <laughs> it does hold a bigger bag. And since these have been sitting here for a few mm -hmm. moments, I wanted to ask you another question. Mm -hmm. When I drink a champagne or sparkling, I hold it like this. Is that snobby, or do you think that's the way you should hold a glass? 
I, uh, if you want to call it snobby, call it snobby. Because um, this show is not supposed to be about snobby. <laughs> but I, I get a little worked up when it comes to my sparkling, and I sort of like holding it like this sometimes. Yeah, there are a lot of different places to grab this flute. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I don't recommend doing is, is putting your hand here. That's going to warm the champagne or the sparkling wine, and uh, that'll destroy the flavor. Yeah, so. and once again, I want to emphasize, for me personally, I like a still chill in my uh, sparkling. So... If I was in my regular environment, this would already have been gone. I would be on my second pour. I probably would have had a little bit less of a pour in here. So, but yeah, when I when I store these, I store them at uh, 46 to 48 degrees in a, a separate wine refrigerator. Um, if you put them in your regular refrigerator, it's going to get even colder than that. Uh, so you might want to pull them out uh, 30 minutes before serving them. It is about 30 minutes then. Yeah. That's, that's what I figured. And. When it comes to chilling these, uh, just a regular wine chiller is fine with a little ice in it, right? Perfect, yeah. And, and a great display item. And as we talked about in the last show, mm. there are legs on both white wine and red wine. I don't know if there could be legs on sparkling from yeah, my experience. I mean, you're seeing a little bit of res residue on the glass, but uh, you don't generally talk about legs. You right? don't, because generally you drink it too fast. And <laughs> which is what's great about sparkling. I mean, everybody knows that they're for a festive occasion, whether it be a holiday or birthday or anniversary, whatever. So generally the pours are fast and easy and the drinking is fast and easy. But mm. what I think I want people to be aware of that there are types of varietals of sparkling and champagne that can be appreciated just for what they are. A great tasting, bubbly sensation on the tongue. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and uh, something we didn't even touch on tonight, uh, cavas from Spain. Uh, they're made uh, similar to the way the Proseccos are made. Uh, but that's an excellent, excellent wine and a great value. And uh, we'll have to slip one into a future show. I was going to, but I actually did not think we would have time to do four sparklings tonight. But the Cava is another one that I particularly enjoy. It tends to be on the dry side, though you can get sweet Cavas, I believe. Mm -hmm. And just like Prosecco, uh, Cava is a name that's unique to Spain, correct? Yes. It has to be from yeah. Spain to be called the Cava. And there are actually a lot of Cavas in stores. Um, I haven't tried them all. I'm sure Jim hasn't tried yeah. them all, but don't hesitate to try a cava. I'm sure there are some out there that will appease everybody's palate. And I want once again to say that out of these three tonight, I'm going to lead towards the Luis, the rosé. Big surprise. I am. All I'm right. going to lead towards the rosé. So I'm going to give Luis the thumbs up. And I'm going to give the Prosecco a thumbs up. This was oh, my pick so of the night. Oh, so we're somewhat agreeing tonight. So... <laughs> Generally, that doesn't always happen, but we get two mm. thumbs up tonight, which is good for the holidays. So no contentious debates before the uh, holidays uh, come to an end. No, well, you had, you had a great lineup for tonight. I, I liked all these. Um, this was my particular favorite, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a different wine for every occasion. So. And before the show ends tonight, do you have a preference yourself for the type of glass you serve it in regards to whether it's crystal or just a regular champagne flute? Uh, just like with regular wine, I think it always tastes better in crystal. Um, you know, a, a taller, thinner flute like what, uh, what you've poured for the Prosecco is best for a sparkling wine. Um, but, again, if, if, you don't have, if you have something like this on hand, go ahead and serve it in that. Uh, it, it, like Bob said, it's going to be gone before you notice it. Yeah, and actually the tall glasses, if you have a lot of family or friends over for the holidays, they tend to be a little unwieldy. And Grandma could just come walking by and bang <laughs> one of those glasses down and... There goes some good bubbling. Yeah. And we never want to lose some good bubbling. Uh, one more toast before the one end of the toast. show. And I just want to emphasize that we both wish everybody's family, regardless of where you are or what you're doing, a great holiday. Drink responsibly, responsible, of course. And do not be afraid to try something that you may or may not have tried before when it comes to sparkling. Whether it's the Gerard Bertrand, whether it's the Luis, or whether it's Prosecco, or as we talked about before, the Cava, which we didn't get a chance to get to tonight. So in Always conclusion, Jim, happy holidays. Happy holidays, Bob. And until we meet again on our next show, I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And keep us in your wine, wine cellar. cellar.